Uh, hey everyone. Um, it's about a good 20 minutes before four o'clock and this class would start. Oh, but I'm working through some hard shit right now. So I decided I'd just go ahead and turn the camera on now and just help me, okay? Because, you know, that's what this is all about, helping me here, okay? So, oh, um, <coughs> I want to take a walk just now. Let me see if I can lower this a little bit here. I want to take a walk just now. And, uh, just to help me with my feelings. Um, this is going to be hard to say these words out loud. Oh, um, I have a friend. His name is Blackberry. He's not even a super close friend. He was a he was a um, an older queer uh, person living here in the in the Bay Area. Um, uh, black hippie guy. Okay, dreadlocks down to his butt. He's been here in the Bay Area since the since the 60s, you know, so he, he's been here through like uh, all the movements that happened in the 60s and stuff. And oh, he's like a long standing guy in this area. And one of the most loving people I've ever met in my life. He's a musician. He writes all these ridiculous, funny and naughty songs. And he like, plays the guitar also. And oh, Oh, man. And two days ago, I got a, I just found on Facebook a message saying he was near death, that he would be probably gone in a matter of days or weeks. So I, I decided, okay, I got to go see this guy. You know, he, he, We had several inter, in, moments where we interacted. Uh, he also ran the uh, queer open mic night here in uh, Oakland, and uh, and uh, you know I went there a few times and played the piano, and he he super hella flirted with me, <laughs> and uh, uh, he super hella flirted with me, and he he never once judged me ever for any of my like gender, sexuality choices, experimentation, you know, he just never, he was just super open-minded and accepting and smart. And it was just, I mean, a whole, it was all these things. Again, funny, really funny, really funny. And despite how much the Bay Area has shifted in the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, he's still around and still here and still making his life happen. Oh, you know, he's a, oh, well, I, you would say a dying breed of people. So there you go. Well, he, he had a stroke a month ago, apparently. And, um, oh, I went to see him yesterday in the hospital. I finished all my finals. I'm going to make some tea also. I, I finished all my finals, which went really well. Um, I altered all of my final exams. And, you know, I'm in such a state, I can't even think about what, uh, what kind of tea do I want. Does it matter? Does it really matter? Right? No, of course not. Um, yes, it matters. Oh man, I um went to visit him. I did all my final exams. The final exams went great. I changed all my exams to be about soothing. I made soothing the final of all my final exams. So we did several soothing exercises in all my different classes. Everything that we would we learned, you know, social emotional stuff we're doing, we. I attached it to some soothing exercises and that went super, super well, okay? And then I went see him in the hospital, you know, Filipino nurse that was on the wing of the hospital wasn't exactly nice to me. 
okay? She had an attitude. She, she just really was not in a happy place, okay? <laughs> and I walked in, and Blackberry was sitting in bed, and he was just a total vegetable, just a vegetable, you know, like a, he, he was, you know, this is a man who was full of life. He just, he was there. He was largely, you know, mouth open. He had a tube in his, in his, in his throat. His eyes opened periodically, but he wasn't looking at anything. His eyes just kind of opened and then they kind of shut. They opened. He looked around. He had a moment, a jerk, a jerk, and they kind of shut. This morphine tube came on. I just, his hands were very swollen. His hands were very swollen, but the rest of his body seemed like all the muscle was gone. So it was just loose skin and bone. And I mean, I just spoke to someone about it and that they, they, they explained it really well. It's really shocking. It's really shocking to see the change in somebody's state when they begin to die. You know, they went from being full of life to the dark. And I'm having all these really just sticky feelings, sticky, slimy, slimy, gross feelings, slimy, gross feelings, slimy, gross feelings, death, slimy, death feelings, slimy, death feelings. I'm having slimy, death feelings right now, slimy, death feelings. I'm just sitting with that. And just sit and cry and stuff up. I'm glad I went to take that walk just now, though. That helped a lot. And I'm glad someone came by and spoke to me. That helped a whole lot. That helped a whole lot. Hey, also, I bought this gender self care workbook, trans self care workbook, which is I'm only on page 20, but I mean, it's got a whole bunch of really great stuff around getting in touch with your gender. And what you went through as a kid, which might have been a lot of pain. I went through a lot of pain around my gender as a kid, so getting a lot out of this. So that 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 also brought up stuff too today. So I had a final paper to write today, so I could be done with all my schoolwork for the semester. But honestly, at this point, I'm kind of we'll see how I feel tomorrow. But what I feel right now is I don't give a fuck. So that's where I'm at on that. I suppose that's understandable. Hopefully I get an extension. I told all my teachers my situation. That. Um, you know, while, while, while thoughts are running through my mind right now, you know, I often... I've been doing a lot of thinking about how, how do you deal with like the realities of being a counselor? How do you deal with the realities of being a counselor and then your own stuff comes up, you know? Like, how do you deal with that? Like, you know, you find out your best friend's dying or, you know, that the, the tragedy happens in your life, whatever it is, the tragedy happens. And then, and then, um, and then you have to, manage that and then go back into the world like a normal world of talking to people and focusing on their problems and how do you do that when you're so when you're in the middle of your own stuff you know or maybe you don't maybe you don't maybe you take time to actually honor your stuff instead of trying to act like normal maybe that's it maybe that's it hmm. Hmm. well i'd have to admit i'd have to admit my interest in going to see him was very much a, I thought I could handle it. I thought I could handle it. I didn't really have much of a problem with um, handling his dying when it was happening. Um, however, when 
the caregiver he has came in, he was an absolute wreck. He was just exhausted and angry and hurt and crying. And he was angry, then crying and angry, then crying. And he was just having a really hard time. He was having a really hard time. Told us a lot of stuff about how uh, the medical system treated him in a very racist sort of way. A lot of stories about that. Um, that was that was very hard. The, the amount my, my my blackberry was in bed, and you know he's a vegetable, so he wasn't suffering. He wasn't suffering, but this guy was suffering. This guy was suffering. And uh, I don't know. I guess I guess part of me wanted to think I was like so doing such a good job of working on my feelings and being at peace with life. And, uh, you know, yeah, you know, I thought I could just handle this. I thought I could just handle this. That's really naive. That's <laughs> really naive. So it, it's just bringing up, a, this is bringing up a lot of deep, well, basically I'll put it, I'll say it like this. I realized this right before I turned the camera on, okay? I realized death, his death, is bringing up my death. So there's my thoughts about death. Right, right. My thoughts about death. And so, you know, I, there's some thoughts I have about, you know, just being afraid of getting older that are connected to death. And then there's my um, my childhood where I was, you know, I, I went through my share of abuse and trauma. I went through my share of abuse and trauma. went through my share of abuse and trauma and that left me feeling like I, if I came out of the closet, I'd be homeless because I grew up in a really homophobic household. So I had a lot of, I had, I also had two suicide attempts, one at 14 and 16. So, so, um, those are all deaths. That's a death. That's a death. Those are all deaths. Deaths. Death. Those are all debts. <laughs> Having a hard time with my words today, but deaths. <laughs> I should just say it. Death. <laughs> deaths. No. Death. 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 Deaths. Okay. There you go. Well, those are all a kind of death. Let's go with that. Okay. So we're just sitting with that death. You know, this is this is it. This is what it feels like. This is what your thoughts about it feel like. So just to be with that. Don't run from them. Don't block them up. Don't hide them down. You went through this as a kid and just honor. Honor the pain of what's coming up for you right now. And it's okay. It is okay. You don't have to be above all this. You can you can be with it. You can be with it. The death of uh Blackberry doesn't bring me any sadness because the man lived a full a really full life brought so much joy to so many people he was just so able to bridge so many like racial cultural economic divides he just was such a I mean, gifted person on that level you know i mean for real for real for real for real for real for real in ways that you know i don't think i could, i don't think i could ever be And then, you know, there's the other side of it, too, you know, like he was all those amazing things. And so many people love him. And at the same time, uh, once, once on the street, I ran into him and we, we just saw each other for a second and said hi. And then it just led to a 10 minute hug, just a straight up 10 minutes hug, no words, just just a 10 minute hug on the street. <laughs> It was the most beautiful thing ever. It was just a 10 minute hug on the street. Okay. I just, I mean, I just, I just didn't let go. And then he didn't let go. So I didn't let go. And he didn't let go. We just had a 10 minute hug. We had a 10 minute hug on the street. So, so, um, everybody was like looking at us like, what, what's, what's going on here? What the, it was hilarious. It was hilarious. So beautiful, so beautiful. So uh, that day, uh, ended up seeing him at some event, and then uh, later on took him home because he needed he had he was getting a ride from someone, but they were taking too long, so I, he just got a ride with me. Okay, 
And, you know, he lives out in New Orleans East. So I learned a bit about the East and it's a predominantly black neighborhood. So, um, and it, it has a lot of, uh, you know, there's its fair share of, um, I don't want to say violence, but let's say um, well, gunshots and people out here like to do this thing where they get in their cars and spin and, and do these racing thingies and make lots of sounds with the cars. That's like a thing here. So I, mm-hmm. so, so I, uh, they, they, that's a big thing out there, he said. So uh, we go in his house. His house looked fine, you know, it was like an old, you know, little old uh, bungalow looking kind of thing, right? So. But we go in and uh, it's it's his house had not been updated. His house looked like nothing had been cleaned since the 1970s, basically. OK, like, I mean, it was a hoarders. It was, it was a hoarder, a hoarders. It was a, it was a hoarders home. It was a hoarders home. I was going to say hoarders paradise, but I don't think that's quite accurate. So it was the home of a hoarder. He was a hoarder, a hoarder. It was just newspapers and lots of just, well, I, mean, I didn't keep an inventory. This was some years ago, but this was pre-corona. So my brain is fried. You know, I can't remember the past anymore really well. So, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he had just stuff everywhere. I, I recall canned goods that were like well beyond the expiration date, all crammed into the cabinet to dust on the, dust on the canned goods. I, I, I recall that. And I recall thinking when I sat down that at some point I thought I'd see roaches, but there weren't any roaches anywhere. But then again, roaches are very good at staying kind of in the dark. In Louisiana, if his house had looked like that, there'd be roaches. They'd be like open roaches just running running around places because in Louisiana, it's hot as hell. So the roaches be, they take over. <laughs> you can't keep your house like that in Louisiana and not have roaches. So, but, but in the Bay Area, there's not nearly as many bugs. So. No, there are hardly any. I don't, I don't see bugs at all. So, okay. So, <sighs> roaches, 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 roaches. So, the the state bird of Louisiana, roaches. <laughs> and I miss Louisiana in a lot of, lots of ways. I, I remember. I I also remember di- drive through daiquiri huts. I don't know if you all in the rest of the world know this, but in Louisiana, you can actually like go to Burger King and drive in, order your food and leave, right? Burger King, Taco Bell, same thing. Burger King, Taco Bell, Daiquiri Hut. <laughs> you can just drive into the Daiquiri Hut, order your Daiquiri in your car, order it. They give you your Daiquiri, they give you a straw, and you just take it home. It's the greatest thing ever. And, and most the, the, the one rule is you have to keep the wrapper on the straw. So the assumption is you're going to take it home to drink it. But, the um, you know, does anybody really do that? No. When it's 100 degrees outside <laughs> in the summer and you wanted a daiquiri, you drove you drove to a daiquiri hut. Are you, do you think you're going to just drive home and drink it? I mean, come on. OK. And then the, the other part is um, what they do in Louisiana is instead of keeping the whole straw separate, they'll take all of the wrapper off except for the very top of the straw, they'll keep the wrapper, they'll keep that part on, and then put it in your drink, and they hand it to you. And the assumption is, it's okay, they're not just handing you alcohol, because they kept the wrapper on, and you're gonna go home, and take the little wrapper off, and drink it. <laughs> and you would think, I know some of you from Louis, some of you in California must be listening to me and thinking, that sounds effing crazy. And I am telling you, that is Louisiana, okay? That is Louisiana, okay? I am not kidding. It's, yeah, there you go, okay? But there you go, know, drive through the Acre Huts. Kind of missed that. The, had I, if, this had, if I had gotten this news in Louisiana, I would definitely have a, um, I definitely would have, uh, I definitely would have uh, gone to a drive through Acre Hut today. <laughs> I definitely would have gone through a, a, a drive through Acre Hut today. <sighs> Mm. Oh. Well, like I said, Blackberry seemed fine, but what really gets me is how much that guy was suffering. How you may be near death, you may be near death, and how the system will still grind on like normal. Just and as a black person, it can just grind on and get rid of you. Uh, apparently, uh, oh, uh, when Black Blackberry was at a bar and he was flirting with some guys, and then. 
the night was ending. He went and sat down in a chair and just kind of slumped down and hit the ground. And uh, somebody showed up and called an ambulance. They took him to the hospital. He was listed as a J John Doe when he got here. So I guess he had no ID on him. I, I don't know the details about that, but that was something that particularly pissed off the, the, the caregiver person who told me the story. Um, and then, yeah, they wanted to, he had no health care. I uh, know no, no health care coverage. So they wanted to just kind of dump him somewhere. And uh, he argued and argued and fought and fought and did this and that and got some, right? She does have coverage, but the coverage isn't good. So, so, but he, um, they worked something out. Okay. Uh, the guy doing the caregiving is also a nurse. So he just argued like hell and got his way. So, so there you go. Okay. So that he, he was, he, he, him being so distraught really, really shook me. Because it just makes you realize, like, death isn't really the issue. It's all the thoughts you have about death, which is about life, which is about life. The stress, the stress, the worry, the fears, the extreme worry, stress, and fears, the extreme worry, stress, and fears. You know, things that push people to the brink of death. Hey, you know, okay, a famine, you know, that happened all last year. There was this big famine that was happening in... Um, in uh, Eastern Africa, right? All these locusts and de uh, the, 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 the water's drying up and there, there's a famine. There might, might, I'm, ass I'm assuming it's still happening now, actually, but it's just not on the news. But, but there was the, uh, the, sp the famine in, in, in East Africa. Okay, so, so, you know, I don't happen to know anyone who is going through that famine right now. If I did, though, I, can you just imagine how emotionally tough that is? You know, like, wouldn't you just want to, the, the, the number one thing you want to do is just do whatever it took to go get them some food. If I knew my, if I knew my parents, you know, I haven't even spoken to my parents in three years, but if I knew my parents were starving, like I'm talking starving, they, that's it, they, they have no food, they have no, like, that's it, they're, they're, they're just on, they're just starving, you know, sitting at home and starving. I'd be doing whatever it took to get them some food. Could you imagine having to sit with the feelings of not being able to help somebody in that condition? That's so hard. That's so hard. That's that's extreme. Traumatic. Traumatic. Well, anyway, my point was death is traumatic. <laughs> well, it's okay to just have some tra trauma, have these traumatic feelings, you know. It's okay just to be with your tra traumatized feelings. And new traumas, you know, like the death of a, of a really good person can trigger all the past traumas. That can happen also. Just to honor that that's the truth of it. I know that to be the truth. I know that to be the truth. So just to honor that. Hey, look, it's 402. This was very helpful, actually. Just, just talking for just 20 minutes really helped me out. I feel a whole lot better. <sighs> So we'll see if someone shows up today or not for talk time. I need to go in and update all of this course so that way we can start the new year. Everybody knows the classes. And I need to, I I'm, I'm talking babble at this point, but I, I need to go and, you know, put all my stuff on Meetup. Um, so if someone shows up, great. And if not, then maybe we'll run through an exercise today because this is, this is all just heavy stuff. This is all just really heavy stuff. And I just, um, you know, I, I'm just feeling like, I'm feeling like whatever, like, like if we can really, if I can run through an exercise, a specific thing, maybe on death, you know, there's a how to let go exercise. There's a how to let go exercise. Oh my God. You want to try that one? Oh, oh, you know what? I always said this. I've always said this. I created this class for me. I, 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 I did it because I have the resources, but the number one person who needs to work on their feelings is yours truly always. I said that from the beginning. This is self-help for a reason, okay? This ain't self-help and then I put together a class and help other people. No, this is self-help and I put together the class that helped me, okay? 
Okay, no BS, no BS. I put together this class to help me. So, yeah, let's do, let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do to help me today. And I tell people about this class, but the number one person who I need to tell about this class is me. Is me. Self-care, self-care. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Um, so this book of you, which is the workbook that I put together, uh, which is what all these classes are based on. If you would like this workbook, just come to class and I will give you the link. Um, all these links that are here on the front page, uh, I now have the book of you translated into Chinese. I got a student who helped me, help me. I, I uh, got some funds. I got some funds and then I paid a student to translate this workbook into Chinese. So anybody happens to be, be a Chinese speaker, you can now you can now share this with your friends and family and get them some social emotional education. Okay, help the help <laughs> help the Asian babies, okay? Help the Asian babies, okay? Help the Spanish babies, help the Asian babies, help everybody. Okay, the Asians and Latinos up in the area, I'm gonna just take care of all of y'all, okay? Got y'all, I got y'all, I got y'all. Okay. Okay, so let's see. How to let go does sound like a really great exercise to work on right now. So let's see. Let's see. <laughs> Actually, let me just sit. That came up first, and I just want to honor that. I'm talking about death. So there's lots of different ways to approach this, you know, this whole thing. You get really upset ever to the point where you can't take it anymore. You can just start on number one and work your whole way through. <sighs> okay. You know what? Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put together a little a platform for myself today. So number one will be how to let go. And then depending on how that work, works out, we will move to how to tell yourself the truth. Okay. Now, I probably could do the how to tell yourself the truth one first, but that one is much more emotional, and I have cried a bunch already today, so we're going to make that number two, <laughs> okay? I'm going to make that number two. And then if there is anything left after those two things, we will do either the judge your neighbor worksheet or the self-love exercise. Oh, the self-love exercise. We might do that. Okay. Okay, let's give it a shot. 28, how to let go. And actually, I'll read the material so that way, if you're watching this, you can you can enjoy. You can enjoy. You don't ever. The beautiful thing about watching, uh, taking this class, is that you don't ever have to. Um, you don't ever have to read anything ever. I'm going to read everything for you until I end up like a vegetable, like Blackberry is today. I, I, I I'm going to read everything for you. Uh, and one other thing I realized on the walk back up to my office just now before I turn this camera on, is that is that the story of your life and the story of how you died are two different stories. They're two totally different stories. How you died is just, eh, you know, you tripped, you fell, you know. You, you're, you're Einstein, you, you got a Nobel Prize, you, 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 you revolutionized, you know, the, the world as we know it today, or you, uh, you know, uh, uh, and then one day you tripped and fell and you, you, you're dead. <laughs> okay, uh, how you lived and how you died got nothing to do with each other. So they're just two, two. Uh, uh, how you died is just the very, very tail end of the story of how you lived, and that's all it is. It isn't the story. It isn't the bulk of it. It, it, it it's just a little slice at the very end. You know, like the in the, the the back cover. You know, and you know you might not get the back cover you want in your story, but I mean it's just important to note that you know. Name, name any book you've ever read in your life. How important was just the back cover, right? Not that important. I mean, you know. <laughs> For many people, the back cover might have determined whether you read the book or not, I suppose. But when it's your book, when it's your book, you don't get a choice, okay? So it's the book of you. So there you go. <laughs> okay, so, so, so death. We're doing this on our... The stress of life. I'm not exactly sure, but something told me to, do, to, to, to pull up this worksheet. So here we go. <clears throat> so let's relax. 
one universal principle of life is that things change. Therefore, no one can truly control anything. Well, that's definitely what this is all about. <laughs> Despite this, how do I let go is one of the most frequently asked questions in dealings with emotions and healing. This is because people often decide to finally deal with their emotions only when a great loss or frustration has occurred, forcing them to accept change. In life, we are taught to have things and to get what we want. So consequently, we are not taught how to deal with loss, be okay with not getting what we want, and letting go. While holding on can clearly create a great deal of hurt and pain, letting go can cut to the core of who we think we are. When our ego is built on needing to be right or having it our way, oh, man. Oh, jeez. Oh. Ugh. When our ego is built, wow, that was amazing. When our ego is built on needing to be right or having it our way, holding grudges, refusing to accept change, or strong fears and prejudices, then letting go can feel like a threat to our sense of identity, so we choose to hold on. In order to let go, we have to examine what it is we are thinking, believing about the person or situation, feel it through, and make space for new thoughts that can accept things for what they are and look for ways to grow from it. The ego is really a way of speaking of our childhood consciousness. As babies, children, we do not have the abilities to be a surviving independent self. So we are hardwired by nature to get our needs met by making external situations about our identity. For example, if I wanted my mom's attention but she wasn't there, I may make it mean that I'm not worth being around, get sad, cry, and then mom will pay attention to me. If someone hits me and no one helps, I may make it mean it's my job to stand up for others as a way to get the justice I initially wanted. While our ego has both conscious and unconscious methods, generally we consciously hold on to ideas of ourselves as good, right, or winning, so our ego goes unconscious to avoid being bad, wrong, or losing. Consciously seeing ourselves as a bad boy or a loser is still an oppositional way of feeling right. Oh. Oh, man. Right, and as an oppositional way, it's it's also a way to take several of those feelings and make them unconscious, your motives. You can push a lot of your motives into the unconscious zone because they're hard to deal with, maybe, depending on what you went through in life. Depression, you know, depression just tampers down all your motives so you can't think well. So you can't, you can't change your situation either. You just get stuck, right? Trauma ruptures our childhood ego, leading to developmental arrest. 
Our unconscious parts may stay stuck <laughs> in childhood dysfunction, while conscious parts may mature and succeed. Our ego may be so caught up in holding on, being right, being tough, blaming ourselves, or avoiding pain, that it will blame others, rationalize, or ever avoid, or choose denial instead of change in order to maintain its own sense of what's familiar. In childhood, these coping mechanisms help us to survive. But in adulthood, still having a child's ego can really get in the way of understanding others and moving with life. A healthy adult ego is one that is willing to look beyond the limited view of our wants, needs, desires, to see the larger picture, and accept the limitations of the present moment. Hmm. Accept the death of the present moment of your friend. Or, or, or this elder, this elder. Elder friend, how about that? Or one that lives in reality. Since the human mind only deals with thoughts, not reality, our ego can only hold our thoughts, not the actual thing. Ego arguing with reality turns the expectations, assumptions, and the other five, five frustrations of life into stress. It doesn't even matter if you keep positive or stay stuck on negative. The stress only comes when your thoughts don't line up with reality. That being said, holding on to a lot of negative thoughts is far more limiting and wastes more energy than positive thinking. Moving beyond our ego's fantasies can lead us toward a life of greater acceptance. Or as I like to say, love is letting go. If it helps, it does help. Thank you so much. <laughs> if it helps, remember, control is entirely an illusion. If we add up all the actions we engage in versus all the possible actions that could happen at any moment, at best, our actions average out to less than 1% control over anything, anyone, our lives, the world, the past, future, life, death, justice, injustice, truth, lies, etc. Who would you be if you let go of all control? Can you control your breath or your next thought? The moment we move outside our 1%, we begin to feel some kind of stress and fear, anger, sadness, and pain. These emotions are here to teach us how to let go because they show us how our boundaries are not lining up with what's best for us, giving us, an, giving us an opportunity to examine what we can do with that 1%. Finally, know that if you can't really control things, then you can't really have anything either. Ownership is another illusion. At some point, whatever it is, you will have to give it back, even if it's when you die. Jeez. Oh. Hey, you know what? That also says that, that that also goes for resentment. That goes for resentment. At some point, whatever it is, your resentment, you will have to give it back, even if it's when you die. So technically, everything is borrowed or on loan from the higher power. You know, if you use resentment as a way to get through your childhood situation because of what you went through, because of what you went through, you know, you, you, at some point that childhood coping mechanism doesn't work out so well. And all the resentment, you will have to give it back, even if it's when you die. Also, if you can't have anything, you can't want anything either. The only thing we have is experiences, thoughts, and feelings. And since thought isn't real, we use wanting as a coping mechanism for our feelings. And since thought isn't real, we use wanting as a coping mechanism for our feelings. This guarantees our thoughts ego will stay stuck on what we lack 
and will make us feel worse. In contrast to this, research has shown that the best way to retrain our ego to let go is to engage in sharing and giving to others. Giving to others what we wanted to feel not only increases our own happiness, it also increases the odds that the universe will hear us. Okay, here we go. I guess we'll do death. Death sounds right to me. What is it you can't let go of? What is the stressful situation problem? I can't let go of how sad and scary death is. I am, I just saw a friend slash elder. Oh, I, I skipped this part, but I should just say this. I mean, this this man, uh, you know, is in his, I guess, 70s maybe at this point, you know. And, um, you know, he was in many ways the sort of older, black, accepting black man my father wasn't. And I would have to say he was the older, accepting black man for many of us younger queer people that our, our parents weren't, you know. So that makes him really important, too, okay. I just saw a friend elder who was full of life he could have a stroke become a a vegetable a vegetable okay let's go with that number two number two what is it you wanted wanted them to do I really wanted to experience feel. What did you want? What did you want? What did you want? Okay. What did I want? That's a good question. I don't know. Let's think about it. I wanted to feel at peace. Peace with this whole death thing. For I want it, I want it seeing him to bring me to to I want it seeing him. I want it being I want it being with him to bring me I want it, I want it to know I could handle, handle, handle it, sitting with him, dying. I wanted to know I could handle it, sitting with him, dying. <sighs> okay. I'm starting to get a little triggered, so I'm just going <laughs> to... Keep, keep going here. Number three, why do you think you can't let go? Why do you think you can't let go? What assumptions, expectations, etc. are you making about the person's situation? Think of anything. Feeling your body where you have held each of these assumptions. Let's, let's pause there. Why do you think you can't let go of death? Or the death of my friend? Why can't I let go? I'm just going to, what's a while? That's a good one. I've been rolling on these feelings. I haven't asked myself that question. Why do I think I can't let go? It's, uh, uh, I can't let go because it scares me that you can put so much work into life and then it's just over or it's over in some really sad way that you can't control. 
Dead in the gutter. Dead in the gutter. <laughs> what assumptions and expectations am I making about the situation? What assumptions and expectations am I making about the situation? I'm assuming that death has to be sad. I'm assuming that my sadness is a bad thing or <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming my sadness is a bad thing or not the sadness. I'm assuming that my sadness, sticky, Death feelings is a bad thing. Yeah, I call them sticky death feelings. That's what I said earlier, right? Okay, feeling your body where you have held each of these assumptions. Yeah, okay, uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Mm. In my brain, in my heart, in my brain, the core of my brain. Yeah, but that's not just sadness. Yeah, it's like there's sadness. There's sadness and anger, too. How are the assumptions really about you? How are the assumptions really about you? I am holding on to sadness and anger, which is what I went through as a kid. Or what I thought death would be in my kid situation. Homeless, uh, uh, disowned, disowned for being, for being gay, homeless, dead in the gutter. If I couldn't get by, couldn't get by, I would have to get by entirely on my own at 10. <laughs> or maybe 12, with 12. That if I, if I can't, that I, that, that I am going to be stuck in this impossible situation where I can't where I'm in terror of terror, terror of the real me coming out. And the consequences. So it's like I am dying inside. Oh, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Oh. Okay, just keep going. 
Oh, 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 can I admit to anything I may have wrong about this person or situation? Um, I can admit that this is not death. This is childhood abuse and trauma. Death is death is just dying. <laughs> but this stuff is suffering big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, meditate, meditate time. Imagine your part one situation. Oh, my friend, okay. But this time you get what you want. Okay. And the other person or God tells you, I know you want to let go of how sad and scary death is. So I'm going to give it to you. Even though I don't agree or want want it. Because I know you need to feel peace. That I could handle it. So that you can have, keep, deal with, you know, let's see. But you can have, keep, deal with dead in the gutter. I mean, let's face it, dead in the gutter essentially means all that shit I went through, right? My kid situation. Okay, let's sit with that for a second. I know you want to let go of how sad and scary death is. So I'm going to give it to you, even though I don't agree or want it. Because I know you need to feel at peace that you can handle it. So you can deal with your kid situation. Your kid situation. This is not about death. These feelings, these are coping mechanisms, not for dealing with death. These are coping mechanisms you call death, but are really about your childhood trauma, which is all about life. Yeah, there you go. Life, life. This is not me being, I can't let go of how scary death is. I can't, I can't let go. It's not, I can't let go of how sad and scary death is. It's I can't let go of how sad and scary life is. It's I can't let go of how sad and scary life is. Death is not the problem. I can't let go of how sad and scary life is. The abuse and trauma I went through is the problem. I can't let go of how sad and scary life is. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. How do you feel? Are they still wrong? Do you still want it? Do I still want peace? Yeah, I still want peace. <laughs> well, okay, wait, 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 hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Do I still want it? Do I still want it? I'm okay with death being sad and scary. Because death is just death. Death's going to be whatever it's going to be. I want to be at peace with my kid's situation. That's what I really want. That's what I really want. That's what I really want. And maybe that's the next worksheet. But do I still do I still want to let do I want to let go of how sad and scary death is? No. No. It can be sad and scary. It's whatever it is. You know, it's the end of things, you know. When the when the plants die, I don't water my plants regularly. I'm a horrible I'm horrible at raising plants. 
they did a pretty good job with raising chickens and a, and a cat, but but plants are not working out so well in my life. So so uh, when I don't water the plants, the plants will, then they die, and it looks kind of gross, you know. Dead plants sitting on my desk look look pretty gross, right? So sad. And, death is sad and scary. That's just the way of it. Okay, that that that's just the way of it. But but the childhood stuff, the childhood stuff, I want to be at peace with that. Okay. okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Well, I just said no, but let's see. If I had said yes, let's give three three deep, honest, real reasons why you're better off not getting what you wanted. How am I better off? How am I better off if I don't let go of how sad and scary death is? How am I better off? Uh, I'm living a real life. I'm living a real life. I'm dealing with the realities of life. How am I better off? How am I better off? I'm actually learning what it will take to get to real peace. Not the bullshit fake kind, but the kind where you've been through it and you know what it takes to really like get through the situation, you know, like a, a crisis counselor. There you go. How's that? Getting through a, yeah, learning how to manage a million different kinds of crises, right? That's real peace, not just the fake in it, it's the same nice stuff kind. Okay, another reason why I'm better off not getting what I wanted is because I realized that all of this is not about death, it's about my childhood abuse. Okay, we're there. Good. <laughs> okay. Three deep, honest, real reasons why the other person's situation is better off if you don't get what you wanted. Blow your ego up. Sit with that. See how you feel. Give yourself some validation. Okay, three reasons why death is better off. Hmm. Oh, wow. How is death better off if I don't make peace with it? How is death better off? How is death better off? How is, oh Jesus, how is death better off if I don't make peace with it? Well, for one, if I, well, for one, it means that we have an honest relationship because, because if I made peace with it, that would be a lie, but I haven't made peace with death. And have any, I mean, like making pe complete 100% peace with death, that's hard. Complete acceptance that you could go at any moment, that is hard. Duh. We, we, human beings have all sorts of ego illusions to make sure we don't, we, we can't handle that reality. Have you, have you really thought that way at any moment you could go? I mean, how would you even do anything? You know, like, 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 okay, let's take this moment right now. <laughs> how do I know that all the radiation from these screens isn't killing me? How do I know, um, you know, there's the something, you know, someone's attached to this camera and that this information is going somewhere that might lead to, you know, someone deciding to, to you know, come to Hayward and do something. Or, or how do I know the air, the air conditioning units is, is, is safe to breathe? Or how do I know? I mean, someone told me that there's asbestos in this building and that I should do my, I should just avoid cracks in the, in the ceilings or in the floor. I should just cover them up with the rug, okay? I don't have any cracks in here, but the chair's office down the, across the way it has a big crack in it. So I guess that's really hella unsafe there. So there's just all kinds of ways. Death, death could be death, death could be everywhere, and who knows? And who knows? You know, for all I know, this I end this video and go hop in my car, and my car it's raining, it's slick. My car slides off the hill, you know. The, the, the tire popped at the wrong time, you know. I just happened to hit the accelerator thinking the brakes would work. And just when I need them, the brakes don't work. And that's it, you know. So that's that's just, so de death is definitely better off if I don't make peace with it. Until I'm actually genuinely 100% there, it's a, if we're having a real honest engagement, a real honest engagement. Hmm. Okay. Another reason why death is better off if I don't make peace with it. You know, you know, here's one. Here's one. If I was totally at peace, I don't think I would have gone to visit Blackberry at all. If I was totally at peace with it, I would have said, ah, he's dying. Oh, well, you know, like, oh, well, I mean, <laughs> it's over. You know, what the great relief, you know, no more, no more bills to pay. You know, I could have walked in and if I had decided to go see him, 
I could have walked in and saw him laying there as a, a vegetable. I keep calling him that, right? A vegetable. You know, I like vegetables. <laughs> I eat vegetables. Okay. I, I frankly, I want to go home after this and go make some Brussels sprouts. So, uh, okay. Vegetables. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fine. Okay. He's a vegetable. Well, Hey, vegetables are great. How, you know, um, um, we all decompose and go back into the ground to make new life. That's how that works essentially. So, so, um, what a beautiful thing I'm getting to see him turn back, turn into a vegetable, turn back into something that will recreate new life. That's hard, but I, that is, you know, no one, no one lives forever. So, I mean, death, death has to do its thing to make that happen, to make life free happen. That's why we have mushrooms. Mushrooms eat dead matter and turn it into life, right? They, they eat dead matter and they help decompose it. It's all, it's all these cycles that make life happen on Earth. Death is so much a part of that, you know? Day flies, you know? Day flies, you know? Uh, you know, flies that only live for a day, but, you know, they, they, the, they, they allow, or their living allows for something else to eat them, and then they live off that. So death is so a part of life. Death is so a part of life. So people need to die. Everybody lives forever. There'd still be people from the 1920s, from the 1850s that would still be around today. You know, and they'd just be 150 years old. And they'd just be walking around, you know, maybe very brittle. I don't know. Maybe Would they be walking around? I don't know. Maybe they'd be in wheelchairs, I suppose. Or, or they'd just be, you know, at the nursing home. Or, or I, I don't know where they'd be exactly, you know. But uh, maybe they just sit in bed at, at, at 150 years old. I don't know. But um... <laughs> hey, you know what? At 150 years old, I would like to hope I'm still getting stoned. Okay? I want to just have, have a day where I can just enjoy my, sip my liquor, <laughs> sip my liquor and smoke my blunt, <laughs> sip my tea. Okay? Put a little liquor in this tea. Enjoy my 150, okay? <clears throat> Another reason why death is better off if I don't get what I want is, is I've been lying to myself when I thought this was about death. If it wasn't about death, it was about childhood abuse, which is sort of like an emotional death, if you want to call it that, you know? It's an emotional death. It's a living, but it's a living. It's a living. It's a living. It's a living problem, not a dying problem. Emotional death, emotional death, emotional death. So just sit with that. The spaces in your brain where you may have faced emotional death. Just sit with it. Just sit with it. You have every right to feel the emotional death you are feeling. Anyone who went through what you went through would feel that way. I can love myself, even though I feel these difficult feelings of emotional death. I don't totally understand this emotional death feeling, and I don't have to. I can give it time. I can give myself compassion by just giving it time, space, and rest. I don't need anyone's approval. I don't need to be afraid of the world to, to, to deal with these feelings of emotional death. Don't need to be afraid of my past. Deal with these feelings of emotional death. I let go of emotional death. I let go of emotional life. I let go of emotional death. I let go of physical death. 
I let go of everything because love is letting go. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, finally take the things, the things you said you wanted to feel, experience, and ask how could you give these things to yourself or share them with the other person or situation? Okay. Um, or what did I want to feel? at peace. So how could I share them with death? How could I share them with death? How can I make peace with death here? How can I honor death? Hey, here's one. I keep all kinds of skulls and stuff up here. You can't see it. Well, you know what? I have a skull. I also have a impression of my teeth. Actually, I have several skulls. There's this this one, a little little tiny one here, and then there's a, a sugar skull and a casing. My teeth impression, the sugar skull and, and the casing, and I also have this art. I painted this for about I don't know, about two three years there. I got into oil painting after I did acrylic for a few years, and I painted this before I stopped to be kind of three-dimensional to get the angle right but there you go that looks about right there you go death death oh. ain't that cool <laughs> okay death so i got you i got you death okay so so what okay 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 how can i how can i Make more peace with death here. How can I honor the life part of death? You know, one thing is I went to see someone in the hospital. I thought I could handle it. And you know what? I did handle it. I went there. I spent two hours holding uh, holding the hand of somebody who is dying. I did handle it. I'm crying up these feelings right now. I did handle it. 
I'm crying up these feelings right now. I did handle it. I didn't cancel this class. I came here and worked on these feelings. I did handle it. I did handle it. I did handle it. And death knows it. And death knows it. And death knows it. I honored death. And you know what? I mm, I can't say I honored death, but I will say I am I I I am making peace. I am making peace. And that's honorable. That's honorable. I suppose if I honored death, I would be happy. I would be happy people died. Not 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 in a bitter kind of way, but happy that it's here. It happened. Hmm. You know, we celebrate we celebrate when people turn 15 and have a birthday party, right? Quinceanera. We, uh, you know, I'm turning 40 in two months and I, I'm not having a party, but, uh, you know, I'm going to do some deep reflection and maybe something nice for myself that day for, for celebrating turning 40. So, so why not celebrate that it's over, you know? You know, the illness happened, the stroke happened, he hit the ground, it's over. He doesn't have to worry about hitting on another guy ever again. It's over. He'll, he'll never have to worry about overpriced overpriced drinks in San Francisco. It's over. It's over. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. Funny and makes you want to cry at the same time. He'll never have to deal with, uh, you know, the police assuming he's a, a threat or a homeless person. It's over. It's over. It's over. You know, you know, no, no more sexual experiences that might lead to an STD. <laughs> Having to go to the clinic, you know, that Monday. You, you screwed around with somebody on Friday and you you sitting at the clinic on Sunday. <laughs> okay, it's over. No more of that. It's over. No more of that. It's over. No more complaining about how San Francisco has changed and, you know, it's not that without what it used to be anymore. No more of that. It's over. You know, Blackberry never had a significant partner. I, I mean, in the time I've known him, he, I mean, I suppose he might have when he was younger, but his whole, in the decade I knew him, yeah, he, he never had a significant partner. He had, he had a ton, a ton of friends, ton, ton of friends, and a ton, a ton of life, ton of activity. You know, making music, performing, recording. He, he did a ton of stuff, but uh, he didn't. He didn't really have a. He, he mostly, from what I saw, went home alone. I mean, his house, the state of his house, definitely, there was no, there was no female in there cleaning that place up, I can tell you that. <laughs> and, uh, well, there was just nobody, there was no guy in there cleaning it up either, so. I'm not sure he dated women, but he might have at one point. So, anywho. He sure had to think for uh, hitting on pretty boys, though, I will tell you that, pretty young boys. <laughs> he had to think for, that was definitely his thing on that one. Flirting. He, he did some hella flirting on me. I was like, hmm, really? Okay. Okay, man. Okay. You, my grandpa's age, but yeah, okay. I'll stop. Okay. All right. Uh, well, it's over. It's over. No more having to hit on young guys and then making comments about you being your grandpa's age. It's over. It's over. If I really wanted to honor death, maybe I'd be happy for him. I'd be happy for him that it's over. Hmm, that's hard, but I, I hear it. That's hard, but I hear it. I'm definitely happy that he won't suffer much longer. And then, it, you know, his body will give out and he can be at, his body will be at peace, too. I'm, 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 I'm happy for him that, that that is the future for him. 
no one should have to live in peace or suffer like that, you know, for too long. It seemed pretty clear the moment they pulled the plug that 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 he's not gonna. He'd probably he'd probably make it a week or two, but then that'd be about it, though. His body might hold on for about a week, and then that that would be about it. Man, I guess by the hospital rules, you can't just kill somebody, right? Not, not in America. So you just have to kind of pull the plug and let them kind of rot to death, I guess, or um, rot to death, starve to death, maybe, or decompose to death, uh, you know, I guess, you know. I guess nobody really wants that for their family member, though, you know. I don't know. I guess it brings up some other issues, too. What if he didn't go soon? What if, you know, this is months on end and he's still just kind of, kind of hanging on? Then what do you do? In a situation like that? What if the bills start piling up? Nobody can afford that. You know, what do they do? I'm not sure what happens, but in America, I got to tell you, it's a for-profit system. So by and large, when these things happen, they pull plugs and kill people or they put people out in the street, you know, and it, it can be cold and cruel, very cold and cruel in America. So I don't, so I don't know. I don't know. That's another part of it that's also icky and hard to sit with. Okay, so uh, from doing this exercise, I got through all my feelings about this. I really appreciate it. I'm not the death part. I'm, I'm, I'm in a much better place about. I will say I'm having a hard time letting go of my childhood stuff. My childhood stuff. Yeah. And something else. Well, I'm having a hard time letting go of my childhood stuff. I'm having a hard time letting go of my childhood stuff. So why don't we, oh, let's do one more worksheet on this, because it's just really right there, okay? Oh, boy, here we go. My, child, my kid situation. the trauma, abuse, and neglect I went through. For being different. Different or just me. What is it you wanted? Or really wanted to feel? I wanted to feel loved just being me, that my uniqueness was enough to make a life where I am just happy. Yeah, what did I really want to feel happy? Just happy, just happy, just happy. Okay, why do you think you can't, can't let go? See, I'm gonna, part of me wants to just hold on to some of this. So I'm gonna do that, but we're gonna put that down there. Why do you think you can't let go? Why can't I let go? Why do you think you can't let go? I can't let go cause, cause I went through a ton. Went through a lot, a ton. And I largely focused on moving on in adulthood and not wanting to unpackage all that pain and loneliness I went through I went through back then. Pain and loneliness and fucked upness <laughs> I went through back then. What assumptions, expectations are you making about the person's situation? Mm. And this is going to sound a little silly, but this is the first thing that came to my mind is I'm assuming that the past is still happening now <laughs> for me to still be upset about it. 
still inside me now in some way. Yeah, and I'm reacting to it. I'm assuming that. Can't think of anything. Fill in your body where you have held each of these assumptions. Definitely like in the core of my brain, like brain stem, core shame, brain stem, core shame, in the core of my heart. I feel it in my like throat, the back of my throat, like all of that just got shut, total shut the fuck down. Ask yourself how these assumptions are really about you. I was living in terror. And that's this kid situation right here. Okay, that's this. And then, what can I admit? To anything I may have wrong about this person or situation, what can I admit about my kid situation that I may have wrong? You know, I can admit I took everything crazy personal and I was hella resentful and tried to crazy judge parents, life had to be perfect. I can admit that my shame goggles may have severely altered how I dealt with my childhood. Same with my parents and what they went through. Okay. Okay, let's try this one. So meditate. Imagine your part one situation, but this time you get what you want. And the other person or God tells you, I know you want to let go of the kids' situation. Uh, let's, let's, let's honor this. All the trauma, abuse, and neglect I went through as a kid. So I'm going to give it to you, even though I don't agree or want it. Because I know you need to, oh, I, because I know you need to feel loved for just being me. Happy, happy life, a happy life. So that you can have, keep, deal with So you can have, keep, deal with not wanting to unpackage all the pain and fucked upness. Living in terror.
Man. Okay. Say that again. Okay. Okay. I want you to, I, I know you want to let go of all the trauma and abuse and neglect you went through as a kid. God says, I'm going to give it to you, even though I don't agree or want it. to give it to you even though I don't agree or want it because I know you need to feel loved for just being me I know you need to feel loved for just being me so that you can deal with not wanting to unpackage all this pain how do you feel are they still going do you still want it no I, I, I hear it I hear it I absolutely have to unpackage all the pain so I can just be me. So I can feel loved for just being me. If I don't unpackage all the pain, I can't feel loved for just being me. That's so simple. I get it. If I really love me, I have to make time, space, willingness, softness compassion to let me go into all these painful spots give myself the attention that i didn't get if i feel neglected don't neglect me oh. mm -hmm.
Okay. So do I want, are they still wrong? Do you want it? No, I don't want to let go of all of this. No, I don't want to let go. It is very painful. And I would say I'm having a hard time letting go of the pain. Maybe that's another worksheet to work on there. <laughs> now let's keep going with this. Do I want to let go of this trauma and abuse? No. No. Three reasons why I'm better off if I don't let it go. Wait, three reasons why I'm better not getting what I wanted. Three reasons why I'm better off if I'm not loved for just being me. Well, that's hard. Three deep, honest reasons why I'm better off not feeling loved for just being me. A life where I'm just happy. Well, first of all, happiness is not about just being unique. Happiness is about making peace with life. And I guess on some level, that would mean about making peace with the uniqueness in everyone, not just my own uniqueness, right? You know, I mean, I guess, you know, technically, if you really get down to it, everything's unique, right? Even two, two bags of paper, uh, 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 two plastic bags, two plastic bags, I bet if I put them under a microscope, even the plastic fibers don't look exactly the same. So, you know, even if it's, uh, yeah, no two things, no two things completely 100% are the same. So everything's unique, technically. Technically. Saying I want to feel love for just being me Well, for one, I had this whole construction of just being me that was kind of really about avoiding all of this trauma. <laughs> so there's a whole part of me I disconnected, disowned, stuffed down, repressed, and I, I'm not I'm not embracing that part of me. I'm trying to avoid that part of me. So to to to, to hold on to this more like uh, idyllic childhood me, maybe idyllic childhood me, the happy one, just the happy one, just the happy bits, just the happy bits. I feel that. So now I'm getting a real, a real experience of life, a real full experience of childhood. I can feel loved not for being just me. I can feel love for being just me, for, for, for just being alive, for, for, for everything I went through also, the totality of what me is, not just the happy me, but the, not just the, the part, the, the fact that I was a good kid me. But the fact that I was a kid who went through abuse and trauma, I can be loved for that too. I've never said those words out loud. Oh. Mm. You know, I don't have to hide away my pain and my hurt to be loved. I can say this is my pain and my hurt also. This is the totality of who I am, and I can be loved for that. It's okay. Hmm. Man. And then three reasons why... All this trauma and abuse is better off if I don't just be happy. Well, I get to really work through it. Yeah, I get to really work through it. I get to figure out what it takes to really heal, not just bullshit it, not just say nice things on the surface, but to every day. It's a constant engagement. That's why I'm taking this class. Every day is a constant engagement in really dealing with the real feelings, the tough stuff. No bullshit. No bullshit. Okay, are you whatever bullshit that's there, you can work through it or take it and use it as fuel, bring it here, use it as fuel and get deeper, get deeper. Okay. Okay, and then the final part was how could I take these things I said I wanted to feel and give them to myself or share them with the other person? Well, well, what I'm feeling right now is I need to validate these painful spots. When I feel them, just acknowledge, hey, I feel these painful spots. 
I'm sorry you went through this painful thing. Um, I'm sorry it lasted so long. I'm sorry you've been sitting there for so long in pain. You've been through a lot. You deserve a break. You deserve rest. I want you to know that, you know, I get used to sort of just putting you in the background, but I want you to know I hear you and I feel you and I'm sorry and I'm listening. And I know it's not easy to trust me given, given how we treated each other in the past. And I'm really trying. I want you to know I care. And I'm doing my part every day to show you I care. One, one step at a time, I'm doing the best I can. Well, there's nothing better than taking the time to validate your pain. Oh.
Oh, man. Man, 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 man. I feel all the pain that's kind of breaking down in my brain. And I was so determined after high school to get the hell out of my family situation, to get the hell out of Louisiana. I didn't leave Louisiana, but I moved to New Orleans, the big city, you know. I was just so determined to get out of where I grew up and wanted to get to someplace better. When I finally left, I was just all about just moving forward, just get the degrees, learn something new, just keep moving, doing, growing, moving, doing. I never, you know, I didn't live the 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 2000s was not a world about self care. That word that word didn't exist, you know, in the 2000s, right? <laughs> not not in my world. So I just never thought I had to go back and unpackage. No one ever told me I needed to do that. I just thought I needed to make a success of myself. So it wasn't until I got my PhD at 31 that all this stuff finally you know, finally started coming up and I had to start dealing with it. And all that led to this here now, or what I'm doing right here right now. It's just something, it's just something. But you know, that's the reason, but I, you know, the pain isn't even so much the problem. It's that I, I was so doggedly about success and accomplishment that I repressed so much. You know, I got them trophies my whole life, you know. I was so much about that that I repressed so much pain. It's time to let it all up. It's okay. It's okay. Let it up, let it out. It's gonna hurt. It's okay. That little kid hurt long enough. That little kid has hurt long enough. You know what was coming up for me here is the only want anyone has is to really let go of control because you don't have any anyway. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm so sorry you went through so much, little kid. I'm just so sorry. I love you so much. And yeah, you know, there's a part of me that just wishes this pain would just kind of, I could get one big pop and it would just all be gone and I could just be happy. There's a part of me that still, even after all this work, still wants to believe that, you know, still wants that. And just be with that. Just be with that. You want to just be happy? No, no. I want to cry up my childhood pain. Oh. Oh.
<sighs> okay. I cried up a lot of pain. That, that, that brought up a... That, that released a lot. Oh, that feels good. Okay, well, on that note, on that note, this has been really, really wonderful. So I just can't stress enough the importance of sitting with your stuff. Sitting with your stuff. If it wasn't for this class, you know, I probably would sit with my therapist, you know, once a week. But just taking the time to do this for myself is just so powerful, right? You know, the odds are high, given how how difficult some of these feelings were, I probably wouldn't have done this today. But as, as the luck of it would happen, I had several things to go to, and I shared with people my feelings, and then that brought several of these things to the surface, and then and then I took time out for myself to, to feel it through, and then I had this class, <laughs> okay? I mean, I, what an incredible gift that I have this life, this, this, this life, for me to do these things, so. So yeah, I just want to take a moment and just express my gratitude. <laughs> my gratitude, my thankfulness, my appreciation. Life is not guaranteed. It could be over in the next five seconds for all I know. But what a gift that I got to at least get this far in loving myself, loving others, making peace with life, making peace with death. And I don't ever have to make 100% peace with anything. I don't think that even is real or exists or any of that, right? I'm just, I'm here. This here now is making peace. That's the only peace there could ever be. I can't know what death is. Oh, I'll put it this way. Death is death's responsibility. Death is death's job. Life is life's job. I am my job. I can't know, I don't know nothing about life or death. I just know I'm just taking care of me, right? And you know, let's face it, we all dabble in life and death all the time, right? I had a salad today. Everything in that salad was alive at one point. It died. Um, bacon, I didn't have any, I had cereal for breakfast. Okay, so granola, granola was all things that were once alive. It had chocolate in it, okay? The cocoa nuts, they were once alive. Everything that's living, everything you consume was alive at one point. That's death. That's, that's, that's death. I feel, I, I, because I have all these feelings, to be quite honest with you, part of me wants to go and eat some fried chicken or something to make me feel better. I have a, I have a drink, have a drink. Everything those drinks came from was once alive. The chicken was once alive. It died. Death, 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 death. You know, my vape, my vape, I smoke, I have, I, uh, you know, these days, thanks to the vape technology, I, all my weed is in a vape, okay? That vape is crystallized death, crystallized marijuana, just kill the plant, pull all the stuff off, distill it into this substance. It's death. It's death. You know, we, I would never look at it that way until this moment. But there you go. It's death. Hmm. Okay, so every time you eat, every time you eat to live, you're also eating something that died. That's, that's worth sitting with. Honor death, that's a great way to honor death right there. That's a great way to honor death right there. Think about that when I go to the grocery store too. Or, or when I when I do my online ordering from the, from the grocery store because I am too busy to go to the grocery store where I don't feel like dealing with the people in the line. So I'm going to think about the death of all of it. When I online order, the death of all of it, the death of all of it. And then as a metaphor, we could probably take this in all kinds of ways, right? I mean, I, I buy stuff from Amazon. Is it is, is how many people's jobs got lost because of Amazon or mom and pop stores that are closed now because the Amazon is a death to that too, right? So okay, there's, there's, there's that also, honoring death, honoring death, honoring death, honoring death, honoring death. Honoring death so I can really see it for what it is instead of throwing my childhood trauma onto it. Just instead of just seeing it through the lens of my childhood trauma. I like that. I really like that. That's a big part of how to let go. Not easy. 
not easy. I really appreciate this class, okay? So thank you, you. Thank you, Dr. Donnie, <laughs> for, other, for this class. And for anyone who watches this, I hope you appreciated it as much as I got out of this. And if, you know, at either rate, please use this worksheet. Practice, practice. No feeling is a one and done. I'm going to probably go home and work on one more worksheet, actually, about my some more feelings about the pain I have. And then I'm going to probably go and work on that on my own. Okay, so, and who knows what else will come up after that. <laughs> okay, so validating your pain. That's another important lesson from this today, too, okay? Validating your pain. Validating what you really went through. Okay, so with that, I'll say good night. Good luck with your final exams. Good luck with life. Good luck with your thoughts and feelings. If you need me for anything, shoot me. Oh. If you need me for anything, shoot me an email. Uh, Dr. Donnie. Uh, 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 shoot me an email. <laughs> and uh, I can't even think of my email address right now. That's where I'm at. And uh, yeah, I'll see you all next week. <laughs>